So guys, as the final week winds down, the Tigers, Royals, and Twins are now all uh, clumped together uh, within a game of one another for the second and third wildcard spots, which will decide, among other things, who Houston will match up with in the wildcard series. We're nowhere near able to project that, but we can take a look at this roster and, and, and see like who the uh, probables are going to be for the Astros in the postseason. Did you guys see anything this week from the starting pitching staff that would change or shift your thinking in any way of the hierarchy of this of the starting rotation and also specifically Justin Verlander's place on a postseason roster? I mean, if anything, the past turn through the rotation, just put one more emphatic exclamation point on it. Framber Valdez is number one. Hunter Brown is number two. If there's a game three, it's Yusei Kikuchi. Ronel Blanco is your number four long man option. Justin Verlander has no business being on the roster in the wild card series. He's 41 years old. He has such dignity and candor in the way he evaluated his performance and where he fits right now. I mean, it's beyond handwriting on the wall. Six outings since his return, Verlander was decent in two of them, atrocious in four of them, including the most recent outing against the AAA caliber Angels lineup. How could one possibly justify considering using him in a best of three series to keep your season going ahead of the divisional round? Yeah, I I don't know how you you go with Verlander there. And I think it's kind of hilarious that we just were talking about Dana Brown going low back at the baseball card with Justin Verlander. And then on 790, just the other day, he said, you know, the, the plan is to get through the first round and then see where he's at. How quickly we we change from yo oh, just look at the back of that baseball card and now it's like oh, we'll we'll check on him after the first round of the playoffs so at least it tells you they they know what they're doing I don't think we really question that but when Dana says stuff like that it makes you wonder a little bit but this is the right move we'll see where Justin's at right now it's just not there he's having trouble getting guys out against the Angels I think he said recently maybe he he rushed back a little bit too soon. Because, you know, he wanted to get enough reps at the end of the regular season to be prepared for the postseason. But he's just he's just not where he wants to be. He's not getting the whiffs. The strikeouts just aren't there. And this Astros team has a lot of good pitching that isn't named Justin Verlander. So, you know, that's just where they are right now. Who knows? Maybe Verlander will have a bounce back year at 42. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't bet on it. But we're seeing the things with Justin, with Max Scherzer. These these guys are just, they're breaking down. They're in their 40s. It's, it's just what happens at the end of your baseball career. So, yeah, I like the three that Charlie mentioned. And, and Blanco's a good option, too. Charlie mentioned that, hey, depending on who they play in the postseason, that maybe that could change the pitching matchup if you'd rather have a righty or a lefty, depending on the lineup you're going up against. So it's nice to have Blanco as an option should you want to go that way. And I tweeted this out after his last outing. I don't, I don't know what JV has left in the tank, but Houston has been very, very lucky to have had Justin Verlander on this team. And I don't mean, just mean the Astros as a team. Houston, as as us who follow the team, very fortunate to have been able to uh, see JV wear that H on his cap over this past seven seasons. Um, he's exceeded you know the nostalgia of that short window of the the Pettit and Clemens teams of of the the you know early 2000s you know to to bring two rings to help bring two rings to this city you can't speak enough about how uh, fortunate and privileged we've been to be able to observe that um again just especially giving uh you know taking a step back and looking at the history of this organization what Justin Verlander has brought to this team has been nothing short of uh just just a championship demeanor and presence and uh even even in you know these unfortunate you know the season that we've had to Charlie's point really handled himself with a lot of dignity and and in no way has you know uh, embarrassed or, or tarnished his legacy in, in any way it's just unfortunate to watch someone on the back end of their career who is as legendary as him go through this and go through these struggles. Moving on to position players. Uh, Jake Myers has really been going through it. Um, Jake, you know, Chaz McCormick, um, he hasn't been ruled out, you know, with that fractured finger. So we, we don't know what his availability will be for the postseason. We know Gamble's injury. Uh, you know, he, he is out for the postseason. That opens up opportunity for Hayward. You know, Josh, you alluded to this, uh, a little bit to uh, in the 
part one, you know, of our conversation, uh, you know, combined with Jordan's gimpy knee, how do you guys project the outfield composition for the postseason and the relationship between those decisions and how Joe Espada uses the DH position? If you're given to prayer for baseball players' health, say one for Jordan's knee. But let me uh, blunt uh, force trauma, stop the idea. Oh, boy, if it turns out Jordan's gone, the Astros are dead. No, it's not how postseason works. Atlanta Braves, when they beat the Astros to win the World Series, they lost Ronald Acuna Jr. for the entire season or for the balance of the season when he tore an ACL in June or whenever it was. Did you see what the Astros did for three months without Kyle Tucker and pre-lousy Verlander? So that they can't do it for three weeks if, oh my goodness, Jordan turned out to need a scope. Obviously, it would lower their odds and make the task that much more daunting, but that they'd be flat out dead in the water? No, because if in 2022, going into the postseason, you were counting on Jeremy Pena to be huge offensively, you're a liar. So if Jordan is right and they have their top five, and against a right-handed pitcher, Singleton's batting sixth. Then you have Pena, your third outfielder, Jake Myers. Uh, Chaz McCormick, Jason Hayward are viable options to play center field, but I think both of them marked declines defensively from Jake Myers. And 2024 Chaz McCormick and 2024 Jason Hayward, which of those guys represents this great upgrade offensively as, as in, in, uh, inept? or impotent, as Jake Myers has been for months now. So I think Myers is in there, batting ninth in center field, because among Hayward, McCormick, throw in Mauricio Dubon, there's not a good hitter in the bunch. And that's the issue, though, right? But And you wonder if they will just go with defense, because they've done it for most of the year. But Chandler Ohm had this in his column. I didn't realize it had been this bad for Myers. He has the fourth worst second half OPS in baseball at 540. Now, on the positive, Chandler Rome also had this stat. Only five center fielders are worth more outs above average on, on defense. He's that good. The other thing that, that mixes into this is Fromber and Hunter Brown are in the top 10 for inducing ground balls. So it's not like you have Justin Verlander who's getting all these fly ball outs that, that you're like, oh, we got to have Jake Myers out there. So, but it, on the other end of it, your relief pitchers give up a lot of fly ball outs. So it, you're not going to expect these guys to pitch the whole game. Uh, you know, maybe it's something where they they put in Jake later in the game. I just they've been running Myers out there so much. This first series is going to be at home. Minute Maid has a massive center field. I, I just. I find it hard to believe they're going to go with anybody other than Jake Myers in center field unless Chaz is healthy. But still, I mean, I, I just don't think it's going to happen. I think it's going to be Myers and then left field. You know, Tucker will be in right left field. It, it could be Hayward, Dubon, just kind of depending on who they feel better in that matchup. I, and I think Jordan's got to be at DH for you unless he miraculously bounces back from what they were worried was a season ending injury. Why risk it with him? I mean, if he's hurting himself with nobody around him, just sliding into second base, I don't want to mix in him running around in the outfield with with other ways to injure himself as well or or to tweak it. You know, that could happen too. So, yeah, I, I think it's going to be Dubon, Hayward and left, and, and probably a lot of Jake Myers in center. There are better, deeper lineups than what the Astros have. The Dodgers, Phillies, probably the Padres, Mets all over in the National League. Maybe a healthy Orioles team, a healthy Twins team in the American League. But the Astros still have an overall above average lineup. And all those other lineups, uh, which one of them has a stud batting ninth, right? In Little League, there's going to be some little skippy who's not very good, so he bats at the end of the order. You know what? Major League lineups, as measured against other major leaguers, someone's going to make outs most of the time, and that's the guy who bats ninth. So at least Myers is bringing you that plus defense as opposed to, sorry, Maldi truthers, right? He wasn't even an above average catcher defensively anymore, along with just the offensive sinkhole that he was. So if Jake Myers doesn't hit in the playoffs and the Astros are out, whether in two games or in the division series or the LCS or the World Series, or they win it, then I'm going to live or die with what their number nine hole hitter does. What about potential X factors, I guess, for, for this team going into the postseason and then any final thoughts on the way out the door? 
Uh, I'm just be- look. There was an era in Major League Baseball. I think the managers might have carved out the lineups in stone tablets, where the question was: Do we carry nine pitchers or ten? Right now, everyone carries thirteen. When the Astros are in the wild card, three game series in three days, there's no way in hell you have any use for thirteen pitchers. To me, you don't need twelve. They'll probably carry twelve, which means Spencer Araghetti is a long man, mop up type guy. In addition, all the bullpen guys, but I would shave that down to eleven and carry the couple of extra guys, position players, for the just in case role. If you're down three two in the sixth inning with two out and two on, pinch hit for Jake Myers right then. Uh, there was a game in San Diego where Joe Espada, it's like he nodded off or conceded, where he let Myers hit against the Padres' closer, right-hander Robert Suarez, when you had a couple lefties on the bench. And okay, they're not big-time batters, but who isn't better than Jake Myers uh, at this point? Um, You know, if you want to pinch run for a catcher because he's the tying run at second base and you're down 4-3 in the sixth, seventh inning, have Cesar Salazar on your roster as a third catcher option. Um, You know, Chaz McCormick, uh, if he's healthy, he makes the roster as a right-handed bat against a left-handed relief pitcher option. Obviously, against a left-handed starter, you'd think he'd be in the lineup if you're going to carry him. Um, is there a spot you squeeze for a Shea Whitcomb or Gray Kessinger as just-in-case emergency defensive replacement? A player gets ejected. A player gets injured. Something funky that happens. I don't see why you need nine guys in your bullpen in a three-game series. I think... Maybe a Spada is going to be one of my wild cards in this. You know, first time manager heading into the postseason, uh, all the big decisions are going to come down to him. And uh, Brandon and I talked about this off camera. Sometimes a Spada gets a little greedy with his relief pitchers, and you know, puts Ort in the game. And then all of a sudden, he coughs up a few runs, and then Brian Abreu's out there having to warm up and come in the game because. They, they tried to get by with a lesser reliever, and then now you got to put them out there. We saw that the other day where, where Hader had to come in because the other guys couldn't hold down the fort. So I'm hoping a spot won't get greedy like that. And, you know, Caleb Ferguson, too, I don't trust him a whole lot. He'll put him in at the end of games when they have a decent enough lead, and then and then all of a sudden it's a close game, and, and you got to use one of your leverage relievers. So I'd like to see that be a little cleaner come the postseason. And Brian King, he's a guy they trusted to, 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 hit, to pitch against Bryce Harper when they played the Phillies. I mean, he's been really good this year. They ended up sending him down because Ferguson didn't have any more options. So I'm wondering, I'm wondering if, if King could be a guy that could really come through for you in some, you know, some big situations. He's a lefty. He's, he doesn't throw the hardest, but clearly the fastball is pretty deceptive because it works. He's been successful. So I, I think he could be somebody that I, I think he should make the roster and I'd give him some opportunities. And how quick is the spot is hook? Some managers get uh, antsy in the postseason. You know, Frommers had a rather mixed bag in his postseason career. Hunter Brown, as a starter, has no track record. Uh, you don't want to overreact and go too early to your bullpen. But when you have Ronel Blanco out there, you know, third, fourth inning, if a guy's to 75, 80 pitches, do you get, uh, you know, that itchy trigger finger? And, you know, if the Astros advance to the division round, bullpen management's pretty easy. Game one, off day. Game two, off day. Games three, if necessary, four. Off day, if necessary, game five. The wild card's consecutive days, no travel or anything. The Astros will be the home team all three games if it goes the distance, but Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. The spot has been loath to use guys three days in a row in the regular season. Is he going to want to adhere to that in the postseason? Or the reason you adhere to that in the regular season is so that for this specific series, if you need Hater, as questionable as he might be, three days in a row, you're going to him three days in a row. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to seeing how Espada manages those extra starters, especially you know in this uh, first series, and especially given the questions that we do have around the bullpen. I do wonder how quick he would go to another starter knowing that he has the ability to do so and get some long relief out of them and maybe uh, you know put out any potential fires. We'll have to wait and see, but uh, you know, we're not going to have to wait that much longer because we're less than a week out from, 
from you know getting a lot of these answers. So uh, we'll end it there. It's going to be it for this episode of Stone Cold Shows. If you listen on podcasts on places like Apple or Spotify, do us a solid and give us a five star rating. That does help people find our podcast. Uh, Josh, Charlie, and I will uh, join you next week for our postseason coverage. Uh, you don't have to wait that long to get your Houston sports fix because all you have to do is subscribe to this channel, Sports Map Houston and Sports Map Texans on YouTube. We'll have more content during the week, including a preview of Jack's Texans that drops on Thursday. Thanks for listening. Until next time, Ghost Rose. Mm-hmm.